the east coast of Canada. And from a, a spiritual perspective, it's mind-boggling how little churches there are. You know, my, my parents are from Newfoundland. My whole heritage is from here. And so we moved back uh, to Newfoundland because it's a fantastic place to plant a church. When I first came to Newfoundland, I remember sitting on my couch praying and just feeling so sad that people that I didn't even know. <laughs> I hadn't even met them yet, but they had no chance to hear the gospel. We are here in Kilbride, and there's a lot of young families here. And in 1892, the, the last church existed in Kilbride. It burnt down in 1892. Uh, and so the gospel hasn't been preached here in 128 years. And so we set out to have people in our home. Because there's a term called CFA, come from away. If you're born on the mainland or anywhere else but Newfoundland and you move here, you will always be known as a come from away. So we had to adjust our mindset and say, we are moving to Newfoundland and we are going to let God work. We know that that's probably going to be a long process. We are seeing the gospel transforming people. But still, when we are gathering on Sundays, I'm always reminded of how outnumbered we are. If I were to get in a car and drive two hours south, you won't find a single Bible-preaching, gospel-centered evangelical church. And so it's the rock, because it's, it's very hard to plant seeds here. But Lord, <laughs> here I am, send me. morning. Revelation 5.13 says, Blessing and glory be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Would you join me in bringing ourselves to worship this morning singing, We Will Glorify. says this, starting in verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with string instruments and pipe. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Hello, church. I was so uh, blessed uh, by the testimonies we uh, received and heard a couple weeks ago. And one of the things that really stood out and jumped out to me was when Marty said, I was compelled to share. No rock was going to testify for me. No rock was going to sing my praises. And I pray to God that that's the heart of each and every one of us as we gather, that we don't want anybody 
to speak of our praise because it's so much in us, we have to get it out. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your loving kindness and your tender mercies. Lord, we praise you that you are the one true God. Lord, we thank you that when we open our eyes, when we take the time to be still, or we can realize all the abundant blessings that you have poured out on us. Father, forgive us when we complain. Forgive us when we're quick to focus on what we don't have or what's not right. When, Lord, we are surrounded and have been blessed with so much that is right. Lord, you and you alone can open your hand and satisfy every living thing. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for you to blow the winds of revival, personal revival, church revival, national revival. Lord, as the song said last week by Keith Green, Lord, give us baby skin, baby skin on our heart so that we can be sensitive and receptive to your touch and to what you say, Heavenly Father. So we commit this time of worship to you now. Invite your lordship and leadership in every way. And all of God's people said, amen. 10,000 reasons. Don't let the rock speak for you. Let's stand and sing and shout out to our great God.
so much. We have visitors here today. I did get to meet Tiffany on my way into the uh, service today. Glad to have her family with us today. And if you're visiting, our ushers are here. I'd like to get some information to you. If you buy a visitor, fly him, flag him down. Take a moment to greet each other. Welcome to Mount Sinai Baptist Church. Good to see you.
Thank you, Mount Sinai Ringers. They've been uh, busy participating in festivals and practicing every Wednesday, and so uh, grateful for their ministry to us. Philip Ledbetter, uh, his birthday's today, I do believe. How old is Philip today? Alan? What's that? Twelve. Big, almost a big teenager, so we're glad uh, he's uh, celebrating the birthday today. Also rejoicing with Stuart and Teresa Cheek in the engagement of Madison this weekend. Congratulations. Uh, engaged to Tyler. And so happy for you guys. Let me uh, touch on a few prayer concerns before we uh, do the Young Adult of the Week and hear a, a testimony. Uh, Maud Poston, continue to pray for Maud. Uh, Jacob Pennington, I believe I see Jacob here today, about two weeks into your recovery maybe. Uh, so uh, glad you're doing well and with us today, Jacob. Uh, Miriam Hale continues to heal up at home uh, with a broken leg in a walking boot, can put 50% on it. Terry McSwain found out she's got a bad virus in her eye and is having some prednisone treatment. Uh, Jim Neils, he continues to recover from ulcerative colitis and uh, trying to get his insurance to work with him to get these infusions that he needs. Uh, Angel Poston's back with us. Angel, uh, glad you're feeling better after your emergency surgery. Uh, Leela Church Bridges, uh, they've got a couple, found a couple spots on her kidneys that they need to check out and trying to figure out the best way to do that. So uh, pray for Leela, recent carpal tunnel surgery. Also, uh, Linda Bowen, gallbladder surgery, March 24th. Richard Bridges, uh, in his recent test. C.J. Brooks is having surgery the 17th. Uh, on his hip, and Carl Bridges, want to be praying for Carl. He had an uh, echocardiogram this week. Nida McDaniel, broken wrist. Some unspoken concerns uh, on our hearts today. Uh, Meadow Glenn uh, had a heart angiogram this morning. She is in the hospital at Levine's in Charlotte, Meadow Glenn. If you pray that she gets some encouraging news and they can rule some things out. Gay Talbert's at home uh, today. Can't put any weight on her foot. Uh, Michaela's here today, nine days away. So we're going to be praying for her as she's uh, the whole family looking forward to this exciting time. Jesse started a new job. So I also pray for Rachel and Nikki Turner and Cassie Birchfield. And my uh, wife's uh, sister, Joanna, had to be rushed to the hospital this week, a uh, doctor described it as a perfect storm. Her potassium bottomed out, uh, had a severe uh, UTI, and uh, uh, septic, uh, became septic. So uh, she's in ICU. They planned to take her to Charlotte, but she was so bad, they, they took her straight to Shelby. So she's in ICU, Joanna Runyon, and uh, getting the meds she needs. If you'd remember her and Tommy, uh, we would appreciate it. And, uh, also, Chris Ray. Our young adult of the week this week is Mariah Kurtstetter, and uh, her information is up on the board there. She went on the mission trip with us this year. She would appreciate prayers for her mom, who just recently had surgery. And also, she's got a trip to Germany coming up and three very important practice tests that she needs to be able to pass uh, to move forward. So we want to remember her. Speaking of the young adult of the week, uh, this ministry has been a blessing to us as we've been able to connect with our young adults and let them know the church cares about them. And uh, so if you get a chance, reach out to uh, Mariah through a text message, a card, a uh, phone call, a gift card of some sort would be great. But uh, Holly Bowman, would you be on your way up and share with us what's on your heart as uh, we are rejoicing and we have some pictures here of a big praise of uh, Kel Bowman asked us to pray for her and her academy, and she completed uh, her work and is graduating. We have a couple pictures, so welcome Holly Bowman. Good morning. Pastor Jim asked me to say a few words, and I don't know how you say no to him. <laughs> but um, as I was digging into the Bible and preparing this, I was really grateful for the chance to reflect on my blessings and share that with you today. So, that still doesn't help with nerves. Um, if I start having teacher talk, it's just because I'm nervous talking in front of adults and I'm imagining all of you as first graders right now. 
that's my zone of comfort, so yes. Um, I want to share how my family, right up there, has experienced God's timing recently. The week of January 22nd, my daughter, Kale, was the young adult of the week. Pastor Tia messaged her the week before, and um, he told her she would be the young adult of the week and asked her for specific prayer requests. He had no knowledge of what would soon be ahead of Kale. None. And he didn't know the significance to us. She had started working as a 911 dispatcher for Cleveland County at the beginning of January, and she loves it. She absolutely loves it. She felt like she finally found her calling. <clears throat> now, I shouldn't have been surprised because she's kind of been training since she was in the womb because my husband, Dickie, is a firefighter, and he would put his pager up against my tummy to make her wiggle. So she's been hearing those calls since before she was born. So I shouldn't have been surprised when she just was so natural with that job. But we were so relieved that she found a place that she felt like could be her lifelong career. So after a month of working at the comm center, she was gonna be required to attend a six week academy. This academy would be six months of work um, and training in six weeks. And Kale was nervous to say the least. Uh, her long legs were just trembling about it. <laughs> um, you see, Kale has ADHD and anxiety. She didn't mind me saying that, so. Um, the classroom has not always been her comfort zone. And that's the way it is for a lot of ADHD kids. She was terrified she wouldn't do well in the academy and in her new job that she already loved, that academy passing that depended on it. So she was very nervous. She was set to start the academy January 26th and she was selected to be the Young Adult of the Week, January 22nd. Do you see where I'm going with God's timing? As Young Adult of the Week, she felt prayers and was blessed by so many of you. Knowing that she had a church family praying for her success meant the world to Kale and our family. We were overwhelmed by the kindness, and we were overwhelmed by how much it affected her. She did so well from day one. She blew herself away. She couldn't believe it. Um, the classes were difficult, and only six people out of 14 that started the academy made it to graduation. She passed all her tests and the state board exams, and the instructor told us how much she grew in six weeks. My shy daughter actually gave a speech at the graduation ceremony. That was very shocking to me. The head of the department, he sort of mentored her a little bit, and, and he has a lot of faith in her. And he even convinced her to start her online classes this coming Tuesday to receive a two-year degree in emergency management administration. And he said maybe one day she could take his job. And I said, that'd be real good. <laughs> she couldn't really understand the difference that she had experienced in high school and then being successful with, in this academy with college instructors. How could she be more successful in the academy with college instructors? I understand. I know. It's God's perfect timing. For so long, I have prayed with all my might, sometimes impatiently, honestly. But God knew. He was letting her grow. 
He was filling her with what she needed. He knew she needed time to mature and develop confidence that she needed for classes like these for this important job that she is going to be doing. Logically, I knew that too, but an impatient and loving mama wants everything to come quickly and easily for her baby. Mamas don't always know best, and that's why I am so grateful that our God's understanding is beyond measure. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 tell us, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. This was a reminder that I shouldn't try to figure things out for my baby. As much as I want for her, God's got this. He has her. He had a plan for her. And as much as I trust God, I still couldn't help but be a little impatient. So this has been a wonderful lesson of God's power for Kale and definitely for me. I could probably stand up here and thank God for this situation because I'm so grateful until the end of this service, but I think I'll let Pastor Tim have this time with you. I am so grateful that he asked me, because I certainly wouldn't have stuck my neck out and said, can I do this? But I'm so grateful to tell you, even when you are scared and worried about someone or something, trust God. Just trust him. Because... It may not look like he's doing it, but he was cultivating her to become what she's becoming. Thank you so much. Thank you for the love and the prayers also. Psalm 118, 23. Psalm 118, 23. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. You just saw the activity of God, something only God can do. And he does do, and he will continue to do. Kel is here today. Let's give her a wonderful hand. Congratulations. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, that's a perfect lead-in to my next thing. You see here in the bulletin, it says, uh, Mount Sinai, Race of Faith Opportunities, Faith Stories. So Holly, I want you to, uh, you already got it written up. I want you to turn that in. A good title for that, for our Mount Sinai Race of Faith book would be God's Timing. And turn that in as a faith story, a way you have encountered God, experienced God here at Mount Sinai Baptist Church. And that's what we're asking our members to do. Uh, by the last Sunday of this month, we're asking you to write up how you have experienced God uh, in a Sunday school class, worship service, a mission trip down at the ball field, some way to give God glory on how he has developed your faith, how he has grown you in his likeness. And we're going to put that in the book called Mount Sinai's Race of Faith. And it'll be like a devotion book. It'll be telling our story of how we've encountered God uh, through the years. And so i uh, love for you to do that. And in the light of our upcoming 175th anniversary, did you know, did you know who the first pastor was? It's in your bulletin today. Uh, we're going to start putting a little fact-finding deal in the bulletin. Uh, Lewis McSwain was chosen as Mount Sinai's first pastor. It was recorded. He preached all year. You know how he was paid? He got a, a pair of socks is how the church paid him. Now, I had a member last week told me they were going to talk to the deacons because I, I brought my hokas up here. And they said, preacher, if you get in hokas, their church is paying you too much money. <laughs> so anyway, what I didn't tell them is I still get my daddy's discount at Ralph Baker's shoe store. <laughs> Woo! He, got them for, he got them at cost. So uh, the Golden Slipper Award winner lives on and on. 
on my feet and in my soul. Amen. So, good stuff. Uh, but anyway, some facts. So, there's information in your bulletin. That insert's going to tell you about some things you can write about. But uh, I don't know how many we've got turned in, but uh, they need to start coming. Let's see how many we can get. And you can write up two or three. Uh, a good title for one would be Vic's Gold Shovel. Uh, Vic Rollins uh, had a gold shovel he sold for $1,000 for us. But anyway, so, and if some people write about the same thing, that's okay too. But let's give God glory. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Stuart Cheek, be on your way up. Stuart is uh, uh, speaking on behalf of the Sanctuary Payoff Committee. And he's going to tell us about this other insert in your bullets. If you pull it out, it says, join our race of faith. What's that all about, Stuart? Tell us about it. You got a hard act to follow uh, from last uh, time when Jason was up here. I went back and, I went back and uh, witnessed that. Um, I think about Vic. He told me that was real. Okay. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to, to talk about this race of faith this comes from the Building and Finance Committee, and you've heard a lot about it, but I'll apologize up front. My slides are wordy because I want you guys to understand it. Uh, so uh, let's go on to the next slide. Um, so here's what we're really talking about. You know, uh, you can see the, the great, you know, faith and, and testimony of, of God's faithfulness as we've, as we've paid off our sanctuary. And that's been, that's been a blessing, outstanding for, for a church this size. But what we're really talking about is really that green bar. There's our, our current balance, $409,000. And, you know, it doesn't seem that long ago when we broke below a million. It doesn't seem like that long ago since we broke below half a million. So it is truly amazing what God has done. But uh, go on to the next slide. So the race of faith, what is it? Well, it's a race to pay off the remaining balance for sanctuary by the end of the current year, 2023. Each lap represents a $2,000 pledge to be paid by December 31st, 2023. You know, we would like for the pledges to be paid by our 175th anniversary, but uh, you know, we, we want the pledges turned in, but you have until the end of the year to, uh, to pay that. Uh, and pledges can be made by individuals or groups. Uh, I said, be creative, you know, challenge each other, and have fun doing it. I mean, there's, there's ways to, to make this a competition and, uh, and meet our goal. But you know, Jason brought this up, uh, but you know, if you go back to 2015, our race was originally 677 laps at $2,000. So, you know, when we talk about 175 laps, that doesn't sound like it's too bad, right? But uh, you know, we finished 473 laps to date in, in, this, in this journey and in this race. Uh, so this 175 laps is, is a sprint to the finish. You know, we, if you look at where we've been talking about complete, you know, paying off our sanctuary, you know, we've had the seize the moment uh, opportunity, you know, where we paid 100,000 a year if a principal. We've been very successful with that. But now it's the sprint to the finish. We want to finish that uh, by the end of 2023. Uh, you've, as, as the pastor mentioned, your pledge card is, is uh, in the information you got today. We need the pledges turned in by April 30th, which is the last, uh, last week of the month. So that's what the Race of Faith program is. And, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to tee this up. So, you know, what's in it for, for us is, is really about interest expense. You know, Going back to the first payment we made on the sanctuary, $5,500 was the interest expense for that month. And, uh, you know, because we've been able to pay our, our amortization down so quickly, now it's about $1,400 a month. Uh, and that's great. You know, I mean, if you compare, we were planning, you know, if we had stayed on course to pay this off in, in 25 years, we would have spent a million dollars in interest expense. And as, as it is right now, uh, you know, we would, we would spend about $370,000 in interest expense if we went all the way through 20, uh, 2027. But is there any worse way to spend ministry funds than to pay it in interest expense? Uh, just think about the ministry opportunities that we would have if we had that $370,000 of interest, uh, interest expense. 
So if you think about the, you know, there's three objectives um, that we're trying to accomplish with this race of faith. You know, first of all, it's to demonstrate that God's faithfulness will continue and that he will complete the work he has started. And we know that's, that's true. But I've been studying the, the book of James and I heard a, a sermon this week about deeds and faith. And, you know, so it's about letting our deeds match our faith. That's what, that's what the people in our community see is really our deeds. Um, so out of James 2. And, and really, you know, the other one is to eliminate the remaining 43,000 of interest expense that we're currently projecting through 2027. So if we make that go away this year, you know, that's, that's the savings that uh, we would see in, in real, real money. So, you know, what can we do with that remaining $43,000? Um, next slide is, is really something you saw Jason present. And, you know, Jason's the real brains of the outfit here. He, he put this, this track together. And this is our tracking mechanism. You know, I'd probably say we will do two of these, one for pledges and one as the money comes in. But we'll, you know, darken this, this racetrack in as, uh, as we see everything turn blue, which uh, we're confident that that will. Um, and the last slide is, is really just to, about some logistics. You know, we got a lot of new people, and I do want to talk about how we treat the sanctuary donations. We don't make that part of our annual budget. It does, you know, your normal giving uh, that's not how our sanctuary payments are made or, or how, how, how that gets paid. So, and, and I think some people are confused by that, but we, that's a longstanding practice at, at Mount Sinai. But so to donate money to the sanctuary payoff, you need to mark it on your check and or use the blue envelopes. Um, and you guys have seen, seen the blue envelopes. If you don't have those, they're out in the, in the vestibule there. But, you know, specific for this initiative, I would ask you to, uh, to really make it easy, easy for Joy to, uh, to kind of track this, is reference the race of faith on the envelope or on your check, and, uh, you know, we'll know that it goes towards this initiative. So, you know, the last thing I want to point out is that just to make sure nobody comes back and pins that, hey, we didn't really pay it off with this 175 laps. Uh, there, is, there is a gap. So the race of faith uh, will raise $350,000 if we sell all 175 laps. So that's 175 times 2,000. And our current balance is 409,000. So there's a remaining balance of $59,000 that will, that, you know, we've, we're going to continue to make our payments through the, through the year. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's where that $59,000 will be paid. But you know, and the other, the other thing that's tied up in that math is, you know, to, in order to eliminate our death debt completely, uh, you know, our pledge that we're making is, is going to be above and beyond our normal contribution. So, you know, we've been doing this since 2015. That's how our, our monthly payments are paid. So we're going to continue to do that through our normal, you know, uh, fundraising. But the race of faith is on and above that. So uh, just be think, thinking of that. Um, so that's the last slide. Jason, did I forget anything? That, is that okay? Okay. Uh, what questions do you have? Okay. You know, this sounds like it's a, it's a, a, a daunting task, but I wouldn't put nothing, you know, uh, uh, I believe God can do anything, and I believe he will do, do what we're asking to do. So thank you for your time, and I'll uh, turn it back over to the pastor. Thank you, Stuart. Lisa and I prayed and talked about our pledge and what we felt the Lord would have us to do. And uh, we give weekly. We have 17 to 20 people who give uh, something to the sanctuary payoff monthly. Uh, if I'm speaking correctly, Joy, where'd you go? It's monthly or weekly? Weekly. Weekly. 17 to 20 who give something to the building fund weekly. And again, you know, there's been the question about, well, I give my tithes and offerings. Well, again, that's toward the budget. This is over and above. But anyway, so Lisa and I are going to continue to do what we do weekly. But on top of that, we're going to run three laps. We're going to run three laps. And if you'll notice in your insert, these laps, what they're called, they're called a legacy lap, a praise lap, a faith omission lap, and a sacrificial lap. 
And so we're going to run a lap. First one we're going to run is a legacy, legacy lap in memory of my mom and dad, Jim and Shirley, who love Mount Sinai Baptist Church, who invested in this church. And so we're going to run a legacy lap for them. And we're turning that one in today. And then we're going to run two more laps. We're going to run two praise laps. We're going to run a praise lap for Carrie, Andy, and Eliza June. Uh, we're thanking God for our daughter who grew up in this church and for the many of you who poured into her. She was baptized here at Mount Sinai Baptist Church. She prayed to receive Jesus in Baltimore, but she was baptized here. Many of you have prayed for her and cared for her. She was, she was married here in this sanctuary. Uh, she was blessed as we prayed for Andy. Uh, answered her prayer was Andy Willis in her life. Answered her prayer, Eliza Jean. So we're going to run a praise lap, thanking the Lord for his goodness to us uh, in honor of Carrie, Andy, and Eliza. And then we're going to run a praise lap in honor of TJ. TJ came to faith here at Mount Sinai Baptist Church, and he was baptized here. Many of you poured into him and invested in him uh, and helped him become the man he is today. We're proud of him and his uh, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, we want to run a lap for him. So we'll turn those in that weekend of the anniversary weekend. But again, you know, we're asking for the pledges to come in so we can be begin to track it. And so that pledge card, you know, you need to check on it, what, you, what you're pledging to. And we've got a total of three laps and we're turning one in today. And you need to make that, mark it clearly on your envelope so the money counters will see it. Legacy lap, uh, Tim and Lisa Trexler. So uh, just to bring some clarity. You say, Pastor, why are you sharing that with us? Let me tell you why. Because I don't want people saying, Pastor, you're asking us to do something you're not willing to do. I believe it's important that leadership leads. And so it's my joy. It's my joy because you know what? I'm making an, in, an eternal investment. It's my joy to give to the Lord. You can't outgive the Lord. It always pays to give to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're, you're, you're sending something on ahead of you. When you give to the Lord Jesus, you can't take anything out of this world with you, but you sure can send it on ahead. And so it's, it's the joy of the Lord to be able to give to the God who gave me everything. He didn't hold anything back. So we're challenging you guys to be a part of this Mount Sinai race of faith. For those individuals like Mr. McSwain who got a pair of socks, you know, for what he did. We are the generation, this is us right now, that we're running our race and we want to leave it better for the people behind us, okay? So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege to get in on what you're doing. Lord, no one is like you. And Father, we thank you for kingdom work. We thank you for the witness of faith in this community here at Mount Sinai Baptist Church and the privilege that the baton has been passed on to us. Let us run well. Let us finish strong. Let us run for your glory, Lord, and to see uh, the kingdom purposes that you have for us. So Father, we thank you so much and commit all this to you, Lord. We give you the glory for what you've done and what you will continue to do. And we're mindful now as we take up our offering that you, Lord, would be glorified and blessed by what we give because it all belongs to you and we have the privilege to be stewards of what you've entrusted to us. Hallowed, hallowed be thy name, Father. And you, and you alone, be glorified. I humbly ask in Jesus' name, amen. Um, yeah, go ahead and start the offer tour. Yeah, thank you, Randy.
Children are heading on out, and uh, the choir's giving me grace and a little more time to preach. Uh, thank you, choir. Thank you, church. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that your word is alive, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Give us hearts to hear and receive what you have for us. Father, we thank you that you're always up to good in the lives of your children. We celebrate how you're working and what you're doing and the fact that you will complete the good work that you've begun. So Father, as we open up the word, we pray for you to be exalted and honored above all things, your name and your word. Father, give us a greater capacity to take it in and to be blessed, as Revelation says, by hearing the word, reading the word, and heeding the word. Let it be, Lord, in your church, I humbly ask and pray in the name of King Jesus. Amen. Please take your copy of the word of God. Be found in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Again, Revelation, not Revelations with an S. There's many Revelations in it, but it's the book of Revelation. We've been working our way through this book, and we've uh, come to verse 5. And uh, we want to focus, we focused last week on how Jesus loves us, present tense. Uh, He loves us perfectly. He loves us presently. He loves us this moment. And uh, we, he is continuously in the process of loving us and caring for us. We also looked last time how Jesus loosed us. He released us from our sins. And that's, that's what this was all about here as uh, we were demonstrating how we all are bound by sin, hooked by sin, weighed down by sin. You know, and there's only one way to deal with your sin, and that's through the Son. That's what the cross is all about, and we're headed toward uh, Good Friday uh, and Resurrection Day, but sin is serious business. And there's only one, you, can't, you can paint this, you can try to cover it up, but, but you will live under the condemnation and the damnation of sin, until you are released by it, and there's only one who has the key to release it, and his name is Jesus. He's God's son. He's the son of God, and that's what the cross is all about. And so uh, you can be released by this burden of sin. You don't have to be shackled anymore to what you've done in your past and what's going on in your your life because the enemy, the enemy likes to beat you up with your past. The enemy wants to, wants to grip you with guilt. He wants you living under condemnation. The enemy doesn't want you living in the freedom. He doesn't want you liberated. As Jesus said, the son shall make you free. You shall be free indeed. Okay, the enemy is vicious. That's why you must learn the word of God that 1 John 1, 9 says, when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us and to purify us from all unrighteousness. How do you deal with the devil? Just the same way Jesus did. You fight him with truth. Truth is found in the word of God. Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so when he reminds you of your past and those things that you've done and you've already confessed them, And you've repented of them. Repent means I'm sorry for what I've done and I'm moving from that and I'm moving in a new direction. Then you you don't have to keep confessing that sin over and over and over again. What you do is you, you you just keep praising God over and over again for what he did at Calvary. That the blood he shed was sufficient for what took place in your life. And you live in that freedom you get your mind renewed and you get your heart filled with joy. Okay, so that's, that was all last week and what, and what God was saying to us when he said, Jesus who released us from the chain of sin, he cleanses us from the stain of sin, he releases us from the chain of sin, how? By his blood, by his blood. So that was, that was last week. That's the power of the gospel, that's the good news of the gospel. Jesus and Jesus alone can do that so you don't have to be dominated by disobedience, shackled by shame, oppressed by and smothered by guilt because Jesus has released you. Hallelujah, what a savior. That's true liberty. That brings us up to today's text. Revelation chapter one, let's begin at verse four. 
John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us, present tense, and released us, past tense, from our sins by his blood, and he made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever, amen. Verse seven, behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, so it is to be, amen. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Very simple outline today, two points on it. Number one, look what we are. Look what we are. Number two, look who's coming. Look who's coming. First of all, look what we are in Christ. Here is our and then some God. Our and then some God. Not only does he love us currently and perfectly and presently, right now he's perfecting us in his love, uh, but also he, uh, he gives us, he releases us from our sins. Not only that, and that is so, 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 so much more than we deserve. We don't deserve that, but that's what he's given us. He's given us love. He's given us salvation. He's given us forgiveness because our greatest need uh, was forgiveness. That's what he gave us in Christ. But he also makes us a kingdom and he calls us priest to his God and Father as those released and freed by the redeeming love and the cleansing blood of the Lord Jesus. We get to enter into a kingdom. We enter into a, his people group. We become kingdom citizens. And also we become priests. Uh, his kingdom is where Jesus reigns and rules. Uh, in Matthew 6, when it says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, what is that? The kingdom of God is the reign and the rule of God in your life. That's the kingdom of God. That's his reign and his rule. We belong to him. He is our sovereign master and Lord. We gladly get to submit to him and serve him. And we will also serve with him in his millennium kingdom. When explaining the lordship of Jesus Christ, I often use the illustration of uh, a car and my, my car keys. When you come to Christ, in essence, what you were doing, to give you a picture of it, uh, you've been in the driver's seat, you've been in the driver's seat, you know, doing your thing, you know, that's, that's it. When you come to Jesus, guess what? You put the brake, you, you, you put it in gear, you, you pull up the parking brake, you get out of the passenger, I mean, the driver's seat, and uh, you say, Jesus, here's the car keys of my life and here's the driver's seat and you say, Jesus, take my seat. It is now your seat. I give it up. I get over to you and you put Jesus in the driver's seat and now you're sitting over here in the passenger seat. Jesus is driving. That's lordship. He's in charge. He's in control. Now, doesn't mean I don't have desires over here in this seat. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, not backseat drivers, but side seat drivers, right? Yeah, they still got a voice over here, right? Still got a voice, you got desires, you got directions and things you want to do. But now you communicate them. You talk about it with the Lord and he makes the final decision. You're willing to yield to what he knows is best as Holly testified to. And so that's what lordship is. When you come to Jesus Christ, you're getting out of the driver's seat of your life into the passenger seat and you're enthroning Jesus on the throne center of the heart of your life. And you're wanting to live a life in your relationships, in your possessions, in your uh, attitudes, your actions, your finances, all are under his lordship and you allow his word to dictate and his will to dictate how you act over here in the passenger seat, knowing that he's gonna get you to your destination. And he knows the best way to get you there. The trust factor, that's where the trust comes in, right? You trust him to do that. And so uh, you say, pastor, I don't know the will of God for my life. Great, great question. The will of God is found in the word of God. The will of God is found in the 
word of God. You pray, you get in the word, and God gives you principles in those areas that you, that you were saying, well, I just can't find this particular. God will impress upon you what you need to do. You begin to pray and you seek him and he will direct you and instruct you in the way you should go. But not only are we a kingdom living under the reign and the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ, and one day we will reign and rule with him in the millennium kingdom, but we're also priests. Now, priest indicates individual positions and responsibilities that are given to us. As 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9 talks about, we are a holy priesthood. We are a royal priesthood. The title and position of priest emphasizes our role in serving God. Note this position comes not by getting or earning a master's of divinity or a doctorate of theology. <laughs> Some visit. Are you ever going to be Dr. Trexler? No, I'm not going to ever be Dr. Trexler. I'm not going back to school to become a doctor. I just want to be a faithful follower at this point in my ministry, okay? But, but you're a priest, not because you graduated or you, you passed the test. It's because you came into the family, and now you are a priest, uh, God says. You're assigned the role of priest. What do priests actually do? A priest speaks to God on behalf of others, and to others on behalf of God. One of the primary purposes of a priest was to uh, bring people nearer to God. I like this. As a priest of our Lord, we are to share the gospel and proclaim the message of salvation, helping people, building a bridge, helping people come to know him and to care for him and to be drawn to him. I like to use the terminology as an everyday missionary, uh, I want God to use my life as an opportunity to put God back on the radar of some people who aren't even thinking about him at all. But when they encounter an everyday missionary, that everyday missionary is going to testify in such a way that it's going to bring God up to them one way or another. What they do with it, that's up to them. But as a priest, we get to talk to God about others, praying for prodigals, praying for lost souls, praying for those struggling, praying for those dealing with difficulty. We're praying for them, but we're also uh, not just interceding for them, but we're also speaking to people uh, about the gospel message, about hope, about help, about healing. A priest, as a priest, we get to speak uh, directly to God about others and for God to others. How did you do this week being a priest? You know, something I know in ministry is that I can't just get up here and say, do, 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 y'all need to do, 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 do this, do that. A part of my responsibility is to provide a platform for you to do something. So every week, when we, uh, when we do the Young Adult of the Week, guess what? Are you a member of this church? If you're a member of this church, you have an opportunity to uh, pray for the young, to be a priest and pray for the young adult of the week, to be a priest and encourage in the Lord the young adult of the week by sending them devotions, by, by sending them a gift card, by sending them a note or a text message. When you do that, guess what? You're a priest. You're fulfilling your role as God's priest. You're speaking on behalf of him and you're encouraging someone for him. And as you pray for them, you're interceding for them. And so... Uh, another way is this lengthy prayer list we have each week that we go over. You know, how many of these individuals hear from church family members? Hey, I understand you're dealing with this this week. You know, just want you to know I'm praying for you. I'm encouraging you. Uh, and so this here is an opportunity to do ministry. It's not just something uh, that we do haphazardly, but it's an opportunity to do ministry. How about, how about this? Last week, we had two individuals say yes to Jesus Christ. We had, we had two people come to the altar last week. We had uh, Brianna Cox, who said, I want to get baptized, and I want to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. We had uh, also Jessica Crouch come forward and became a member. An opportunity for you to send them a note of encouragement or for you to, to reach on them, uh, reach out to them for that particular week. So... Just ways to, that we can be priests. What else do priests do? They offer, do. they offer sacrifices to God. A priest offers sacrifices to God. Is there something you need to sacrifice? 
or you need to deny yourself of, to put God in his rightful place, is there a relationship, are your relationships pleasing to the Lord? Or do you need to say, hey, this isn't going the way, this isn't going to be blessed of God because it's not according to God's word and God's will. It's, it's, it's in line with the world's philosophy of relationships, not God's. Is there a situation in your relationships that require you to sacrifice maybe pride or ego and maybe an unforgiving spirit? Priests make sacrifices to the Lord. Why? To please the Lord. In fact, Romans 12, 1 tells us as believers that uh, we have become, the, because we have become the recipients of God's mercy and grace, Romans 1 through 11 tells us about it. He gets to verse 12 and he says, therefore, because of God's goodness, because he treated you better than you deserve, because he didn't treat you as your sins deserve, Paul says, therefore, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service of worship, and do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. So what he's saying there is that you, as a priest, are now a living sacrifice. Now, here we go. Here's our altar. Here's our altar, all right? So here's the thing about a living sacrifice. A dead sacrifice isn't going anywhere. It may slide off the altar, but a living sacrifice is, here we go. Living sacrifice, you have the choice. Paul says, present yourself a living sacrifice. So you have a choice to get to put yourself on the altar, right? To put yourself on the altar, okay? Notice what I'm doing here. Am I all the way on the altar? I still got a foot in the world, don't I? I'm still, I'm still clutching. Lord, you can have this part, but I'm gonna hang on to this part. Is that presenting yourself a living sacrifice? Absolutely not. A living sacrifice means I'm up, I'm up here. Lord, I belong to you. Lord, I want you to have all of me. I want you to consume me so you can use me. When you allow God to consume you, he will use you. Now, the problem is the world likes to pull us off and the flesh is still there. The nature you feed the most wins the most. The nature you feed the most wins the most. Now, how, do you, how does a believer stay on the altar and not, and not keep coming down. In the Old Testament, when they would slay an animal, the animal would often slip off because of the blood. They would put it on the altar and it would just slide off and slide off. So they, they put two flesh hooks on the altar to, to uh, fasten that animal on the altar so it wouldn't fall off so it could be fully consumed. There's two flesh hooks for the, Christ, for the Christian, two flesh hooks, devotion and discipline. As a believer, if you want to stay on the altar, you need to have devotion and discipline. That will anchor you in and keep you on God's altar. Discipline and devotion, devotion and discipline, the two flesh hooks. Here's the definition I wrote up for devotion. Devotion is a strong desire to live to please the Lord at all times and in all places. Devotion is a strong desire to live to please the Lord at all times and all places. Devotion means I'm making Jesus number one in my life. I'm putting Christ in first place. I'm being devoted to him above and beyond any other person, including my spouse, my child, my parents, my friends, etc. Beyond any other thing. Any hobby, possession, position, or pursuit, I am being devoted. Colossians 1.10 really nails down uh, what devotion looks like. It's the ABCs of devotion. Uh, aim to please the Lord in all regards, all respects. Bear fruit in every good work. And continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of God and in your love relationship. That's the ABCs of devotion right there out of Colossians 1.10. So one hook is I've got to be devoted to the Lord it's got to be something I'm devoted to. Uh, the other one is discipline. Now what about discipline? Discipline, here's the definition I wrote of discipline. It's an act of the will. I cannot emphasize that enough. It is an act of the will. It's not based on your feelings. 
If you wait till you feel like doing something, it's not going to happen a lot of times. It's easier to act your way into a new way of feeling than to feel your way into a new way of acting. That, that's, that's truth right there. It's easier to act. I don't feel like it, but I'm going to act like it. It's easier to act your way into a new way of feeling than to feel your way into a new way of acting. And so this, this discipline is an act of the will to do what's right and what needs to be done regardless of how I feel, what others say, or what it will cost. That's my definition of discipline. Then I'm going to try to, I'm going to be disciplined to be in the Word every day because not only am I getting in the Word, but the Word's getting into me. I'm going to be disciplined to talk to my Father every day because I... I I, I depend on them. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Lord, I need your help. I need your strength, Lord. Father, help me to see the way of escape when temptation comes, Lord, and help me to be willing to take it, not just see it, but help me to take it. Uh, Lord, help me to dress up in the armor, to dress for success, to put on the armor of God as I do battle with the enemy. And so discipline is one of the flesh hooks that will keep you on the altar. Now, you talk about discipline. Uh, I got a picture of Casey and Chris Renfro. Uh, here's what Casey wanted to do for her 40th birthday, March the 4th. She wanted to run half a marathon. So March the 4th, she was at Myrtle Beach, and Chris, being a faithful, loving husband, said, I'm going to run it with you. And so I, asked, I talked to Casey. She's here today. I said, uh, tell me, when did you start training? She said, in December. She had the discipline of mind to start training for this half marathon, 13.1 miles, half marathon. But she hurt her foot in the process. So she had to back off. She wasn't able to do all her training. But she said, I was determined to run it. And she did because of discipline. She was fastened with discipline. And she ran, and Chris ran too. And there they are completing their race, hitting the finish line there at Myrtle Beach on March the 4th. Hallelujah. Give him a hand. Give him a hand. All right. Now, so I was telling Lisa about that. She said, well, you know what? She said, Christy Kennedy just ran one too. I said, well, let me call Christy. So I called Christy Kennedy and she went down to Florida. She went down to Disney World and, uh, and, and ran. I said, Christy, when you start training? She said, a year ago. And so she started that process of training. Now, what Christy did, she ran a 5K on Friday, she ran a 10K on Saturday, and she ran half a marathon on Sunday. She got her laps in. She went after it. And she, she hit the finish line there because she was disciplined, right? So discipline is something that, that will get you. Discipline without direction is drudgery. Discipline with direction is delight. And so the two flesh hooks that will keep you, let's give her a hand too. Are you in here somewhere? All right. The two flesh hooks that will keep you where you need to be in the Christian life, discipline and devotion. Amen. Here's a great passage that will provide devotion, will feed devotion and will feed discipline. Genesis 39, 9b. How then could I do this great evil and sin? against God. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? And so as we think about what it means, what it looks like for you to be disciplined, what area of your life needs to come under the lordship of Christ? Maybe, maybe, you're, maybe you're still, maybe you're not out of the driver's seat yet. You know? You're still hanging on to that steering wheel. And Jesus is not going to pull you out of there. Look to the cross. You need motivation to get out of the driver's seat. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. What joy? Your salvation. Your salvation. So what's keeping you in the driver's seat of your life? Holly said it. Do you not trust him? Maybe you need to get, Lord, I, I don't see my way clear. I don't see how when I start tithing, Lord, I'm going to have enough money to pay my bills, Lord. I don't, I don't see how that's going to work out, Heavenly Father. When I start giving to you and giving you priority, Lord, if I let go of this thing in my life, I have security in this thing, Lord, 
I know it's not right, Lord. I know it doesn't please you, but this is where I get my identity, Lord. This is where I get my security. Trust and obey. They go together. Trust and obey. So as we wrap up today, how do you need to trust and how do you need to obey? How do you please the Lord? John 15, 8 says, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so prove to be my disciples. So that's what we are. We're in a kingdom. We're kingdom citizens. Living under the reign and rule of Jesus and we will reign and rule with him one day in the millennium kingdom. So we're, we're in the kingdom, but we're also priests. And as a priest, we have the, we have the privilege to speak to God on behalf of others and to speak to others on behalf of God. How do you need to work those into your life? Well, I'm going to pass on point two and bring it to you next week. But uh, I will give you the sermon in a sentence. I think there's been enough meat here to chew on, wouldn't you think so? It's not the truth. It's not the truth we know that sets us free. It's the truth we apply. So as we meditate on discipline and devotion and being a priest and being in the kingdom, would to God that we would be effective and bear fruit that would pre- please our Lord. So our sermon in the sentence. Behold Jesus is coming, be prepared. We didn't get to that verse, but he's coming. Whether we get to that verse or not, he's coming. His coming is nearer today than it's ever been before. You can always say that. His coming is nearer today than it's ever been before. There is nothing keeping him from coming in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, just like that. Nothing. He could come. We are literally living on the edge of eternity. Just a matter of a quick step over. And so are you prepared? Are you ready? Application points. List particular ways you can fulfill your role as a priest this week. A priest speaks to others about God and to God about others. Number two, in what ways do you need to practice a greater devotion and discipline to be a living sacrifice? You have a choice to be a living sacrifice. Read Romans 12, 1 and 2 and pray for God's guidance and grace to be faithful. And number three, faith at home. Discuss as a family or with a friend how you need to prepare for the Lord's return. Are you ready? Who do you know that is not prepared and how can you help them prepare? Are you still chained to sin? Are you still carrying something around? Jesus longs to set you free. Too many people try to get free before they come to Jesus. Lord, I need to get this cleaned up in my life, and then I'll come to you. No, no, that's the devil's thinking. That's the devil's thinking. You humble yourself. God's looking for a brokenness. Lord, I don't like the way I'm living. Lord, I'm sorry for displeasing you, Lord. The things I'm living for are not worth what you died for, Lord. I want that reversed in my life, Lord. I want the things I'm living for, Lord, to be in light of what you did for me. So whatever that is in your life, this altar is an opportunity for you to come do business with the Lord. And when you speak truth to God, when you mean business with God, he'll mean business with you. And he will honor, he will honor you and he will give you power and authority to live the life he's called you to live. Father in heaven, we humble ourselves before you. We thank you for the power of the gospel to save anyone, anywhere, anytime. And it's not just the gospel that saves us. It's the same gospel that sustains us. It's the same gospel that carries us through and gives us the grace, grace for the race. So, Lord, I pray today for a freedom. I pray for a liberty. I pray for a deep cleansing within this congregation. I pray, Lord, that we would say, Lord, hear my, revive me. I'm willing, Lord, to be willing to be revived, Lord. I want to take a step towards you, Lord. I want to take my next step to experience you. Whatever that looks like, Lord, give us the courage to honor you and to follow you and to obey you, Lord. You are worthy of all of our worship, all of our praise. Thank you for the way you love us perfectly. 
presently and completely. Hallowed be thy name. Move in this invitation today, Lord, for your glory and honor. I humbly ask and pray in Jesus' name. Here's the gospel. The gospel is real simple. Eternal life is in Jesus Christ alone. Eternal life is God's free gift. And you can be certain that you have eternal life. Romans 10, 9 says, if you will confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God, raise him from the dead, you will be saved. If you don't know where you would go when you die and you want to get right with God, Andrew will be down uh, to my right. I'll be to the left. This altar is open and we want to help you and we want to serve you however we can. But the greatest thing we can do is to trust and obey. There's no other way. Let's stand and worship as we sing during our invitation hymn. Out of my bondage, sorrow and night. church. Uh, if anybody wants to go on our summer mission trip, we'll be having a meeting coming up soon. But if you want to sign up, interested in going, that sign up sheet is here. Very important leadership meeting tonight. If you're on the leadership, we are asking you to be here tonight at 630 here as we uh, are going to be breaking up as children's leaders, student leaders, and adult Sunday school leaders. So if you're a Sunday school teacher, you'll get to be meeting with uh, Jerry McCraw. And also we're going to hear about a ministry myth. Uh, from Robbie Gallatry, a uh, wonderful session that we got uh, blessed by when we went to the Disciple Making Conference. 6.30 here, leadership. If you're not on leadership and you want to come anyway, you're welcome to come, see what God's doing here at Mount Sinai Church Council. We'll meet at the conclusion of that meeting. Anybody else got anything? All right, church, let's go be priests and live in the kingdom for the glory of God. God bless you.